test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. Hear a conversation between a woman and the librarian. Now you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now listen to the talk and answer the questions 1 to 6. Good morning. Good morning. Can I help you? Yes, I'd like to join the library. We're new to the district, you see. Hmm, certainly. Well, all we need is some sort of identification with your name and address on it. Oh dear. We just moved, you see, and everything has my old address. A uh, driving license, perhaps? No, I don't drive. No, your husband's would do. Yes, but his license will still have the old address on it. Hmm, perhaps you have a letter addressed to you at your new house. No, I'm afraid not. We've only been there a few days, you see, and no one's written to us yet. Well, what about your bank book? That's just the same. Oh dear, and I I did want to get some books out this weekend. We're going on holiday to relax after the move, you see, and I wanted to take something with me to read. Well, I'm sorry, but we can't possibly issue tickets without some form of identification. What about your passport? What? Oh, yes, how silly of me. I've just got a new one, and it does have our new address. I've just been to book our air ticket, so I have it on me. Ah, oh, well, that's all right. Your ticket will be ready soon. OK. Um, how many books am I allowed to take out? You can take four books out at a time, and you can also get two tickets to take out three magazines or periodicals. Newspapers, I'm afraid, can't be taken out. Oh, that's fine. Uh, do you have a record library? Some libraries do, I know. Yes, we do. You have to pay a deposit of $5 in case you damage them. But that entitles you to take out two records at a time. That's good. Could you show me where your history and biography sections are, please? Yes, just over there to your right. If there's any particular book you want, you can look it up in the catalogue, which you'll find just around the corner. You can also find a touchscreen information service on level two. Thank you. Oh, and how long am I allowed to keep the books for? Well, the normal loan period is three weeks, with two weeks extension. Oh dear. We're going away for four weeks. Can I renew them now? Mm, I'm afraid not. You must do that at the end of three weeks. I see. Thank you very much. Before the talk continues, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen to the talk and answer the questions 7 to 10. Well, let's go into some details. Your name, please, madam. My name is Barbara. The surname is Cooper. It's spelt as C-O-O-P-E-R. Fine. And what's your contact number? If we have new books coming, we can contact you in time. Good. You can call me on 723-6518. But it's better after 5 p.m. You know I have to work during the daytime. Do you need the office number? I don't think so. It's enough. Could you tell me the address? I lived in King Road, but of course you need my new address. Um, it's 25 St. Mary Road, Hanwell. That's H-A-N-W-E-L-L. -L. Is that right? Yes. Do you need the passport number? I just brought it with me. Here you are. Yes, thank you. The number of your passport is G5798-0942. OK, and your ticket is ready. The number is M930123. Thank you. Could I take a look around and check out some books? Of course, as you like.
That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a discussion between two students and their tutor. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. OK, guys. First off, well done. That was a very good presentation yesterday. Now I'm just going to ask you questions about it before I give you my feedback. Is that OK? Sure. Of course. Right. Well, in that case, tell me, Niall, why did you choose to talk about Rafael Nadal? To tell you the truth, I didn't. I think I... Better let Sheena handle this one. Sheena? Yes, it was my decision to pick Nadal. Now, that might be a strange choice for a presentation entitled Someone Who Inspired Me to Study Psychology, but... Yes, but I was going to say, it does seem rather an odd choice. Was it simply down to the fact that he's a sporting hero of yours and so a role model? You talk about him a lot, Sheena, so this much is clear. It's true, Nadal is someone I look up to, but my reasons for choosing him were totally professional. You see, I doubt, perhaps in the history of tennis, that there was ever a better match player than him, and that got me thinking, what is the secret to his success? How does he control his nerves so splendidly? The more we started to look into his background, the more I realised Sheena was right. Nadal was a perfect candidate for this study. He is, on so many levels, a very well-balanced character, and it was fascinating to gain an insight into the mind of this great champion over the last few weeks. I'll admit that I was at first somewhat unsure about whether or not I should back Sheena on this one, but it didn't take long for our research to put us at ease. So, while most of the students were researching Freud and other visionaries in the field of psychology and psychoanalysis... You were looking into a present-day sports star? Does that not strike you as a little odd? Of course, we knew it was a risk. After all, there was a danger that no one, least of all you, would take us seriously. When we stood up on stage and started our presentation. That said, I think it is in the spirit of psychology to be inquisitive and adventurous, and not just stick to the conventional. Otherwise, how would the field have come so far? as it has done already. Well, I must say, your risk certainly paid off. Yours was, without a shadow of a doubt, the most interesting and original presentation I saw. And judging by the reactions of the other students, I would have to say that everyone else was equally impressed. Thank you. I'm so glad you think so. Yes, but... Notwithstanding your excellent presentation content, we must remember that the marks for this project are awarded based on a number of criteria, and we'll examine those in a few minutes. But first, another question. Where did you find your sources? Well, and I don't quite know how we managed it, but we were able to secure a face-to-face -face interview with Nadal while he was over here for the Wimbledon Tennis Championship, so we weren't reliant on newspaper articles and interviews or any other forms of secondary sources. We did, however, find the library's sports archive an invaluable backup aid to help us fill in the gaps and piece together our interpretation of what makes Nadal such a mentally strong champion. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Hey. Well, as I said, congratulations again for your excellent work. Now it's time for my feedback. The first area where marks were awarded is in your use of equipment. I felt that had you not been a little too reliant on the overhead projector, and had you, for example, used the interactive whiteboard and audio equipment a little more effectively, you would have received top marks in this section. As things stand, though, your use of equipment was still very satisfactory. It's just a shame as it was an opportunity missed to score full points. The next area I was asked to assess is content. As you might have guessed, I simply can't fault you on that. Highly original work, so well done. As for your timing, I felt that the two of you were a little too over-rehearsed, so the presentation felt, at times, a little robotic. That said, again, it was very satisfactory, and you would get full points for effort. Sadly, though, there is such a thing as trying too hard, and that cost you top marks here, I'm afraid. Oh, I see. Right. What was particularly impressive, though, was the thick handout you'd prepared for everyone. I took it home to read through it afterwards, and it was very well written. But not alone that, it also enhanced my experience of the presentation itself on the day, as I was able to refer to the handout for further information on what was being discussed and to answer any questions I had. Very nice. As for your level of interaction, well, you had so much that you were intent on packing into your 20-minute time slot that, sadly, you run out of time at the end, which left no room whatsoever for interaction and no one had the chance to ask you any questions. You've probably guessed, therefore, that you did worse than average in this department and, unfortunately, your score will have to reflect this. Oh, my goodness. Everything sounded so positive at the start. That is a big disappointment. We work so hard. Now, now, don't be so quick to get deflated. Remember, your presentation skills only count for 15% of the project grade. Your score in this assessment, even if it were terrible, would still not be enough to prevent you from getting top marks overall. It's very hard to score well in the presentation assessment anyway, so believe me, you both did reasonably well. Thank you. I wish I felt like that. Yes, your feedback was very constructive. We're just a little disappointed with ourselves. Why? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a business study student called Sam talking to his tutor about an IT project he is going to do for a local company called Turner's. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 26. Hello, Sam. Come in and sit down. Thanks. You're here to discuss your company-based IT project, aren't you? Yes. I've been to see the manager and he's given me a lot of ideas about projects that the company would find useful. But I wanted to ask your opinion about them before I choose one. Yes, that's fine. 
Now, this company's called Turner's, isn't it? That's right. It's a small engineering company. They make machine components for trade use. They're well established. They started in 1976, but they're a bit old fashioned. Okay. And what kind of projects did Turner's suggest you could do for the company? Well, they want some improvements made to their customer database. Uh, the one that they've got at the moment isn't very useful in some ways. I had a quick look at it. Uh, mm. That would be a very straightforward project, and it'd be simple enough to evaluate, but I don't think you'd get enough out of a project like that. You wouldn't learn anything new. Well, another project they suggested is to do with their online sales catalogue. At the moment, customers can look at their products, but they can't actually order them online, which m must affect their competitiveness. But I said I thought it would take too long. It's quite a big task. You're right. It's too much for the time you've got. It's a pity, though. Then they want some help with their payroll system. At the moment, the way they calculate pay involves a lot of manual accounting. I suggested they could have a system where employees register electronically when they arrive and leave work, so the hours they do could be transferred automatically. Hmm. I think you'd get a lot out of a project like that. It would extend your skills, but it wouldn't be too much to take on. A student did something similar a couple of years ago, but this is slightly different. Hmm. Well, then they need help with their stock inventory. They do everything manually. Really? <laughs> yes, and it takes so much time. Ugh. It's probably very inaccurate, too. An electronic inventory would probably be the biggest single benefit for the company. I'm surprised they haven't had it done before. Oh, I know. Then they wanted to improve their internal security. The manager had visited other companies where the staff use uh, swipe cards to access various areas of the building. It sounded useful, but the trouble is I'm not really sure how to do it. Well, I think you're right in that assessment. At the moment, it's probably a bit beyond your level of knowledge. Is that all? Just one more. Customer service. They want to be able to collect feedback from their customers in a more systematic way. At the moment, it's a bit of a mess, and they probably lose business as a result. Would that involve you going to see customers at their own premises? Because in that case, you might have to do a fair amount of traveling, and that would incur expenses that haven't been agreed with these companies. I never thought of that. Well, it might not be a problem, but it's something that needs clarifying, well, I hope that's been helpful in narrowing down the options. Yes, it has. Thanks. I'll be able to make a decision now. But while I'm here, can I talk to you about coursework? Sure. Now you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. I'm not very happy about the way our group assignment is working. There are some problems. Oh dear. Are people just not getting on with each other? That's the worst thing. Actually, we're all friends. It's not that. But when we're having a discussion about the assignment, one or two people end up doing all the talking and the rest don't say anything. It's... A bit frustrating because we need plenty of debate. Well, that's a common observation. You're studying in a group with people from all over the world and you all have your own ways of participating. In some places, students are more used to listening than talking and vice versa. Mm, I suppose you're right. I'll try to remember that. Does everyone pull their weight as far as sharing the workload is concerned? I'd say they do, yes. And... Our group elected uh, a leader. She's very good at making sure no one's overloaded. But personally, I feel that there are just too many of us in the group. Whenever we try to arrange a meeting, there's always at least one person who can't make it. It's not anyone's fault. It's just that we've all got slightly different timetables. Well, I'm glad you've talked to me about it. Feedback is always useful. Is there anything else you're concerned about? Uh, there are a couple of problems with lecturers that all the students are talking about. Hmm. Last semester we had negative feedback about the way lectures were organized. 
There were several occasions when the wrong room had been booked or the same room had been booked twice, that sort of thing. Is that still a problem? That hasn't happened at all as far as I know. Oh, good. It's sorted out then. But I don't know the reason, but some of the staff often turn up late, so we miss 10 or 15 minutes of our lecture time. It might be because they've been copying handouts for students. I think there's a queue for the machine sometimes. Well, I'll look into that. Thank you for telling me. Anything else? <laughs> the other thing is that it can be very difficult to get to see a lecturer individually. They're all very supportive and friendly when you do manage to find them, but often they're not in their office, even at times when they're meant to be available for consultation. OK, that's helpful. Now, before you leave... Uh, let That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. This is Jane Frost with this morning's edition of Wake Up with Frost. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning. This is Jane Frost with this morning's edition of Wake Up With Frost. As you all know, for the last week we've been running a survey, trying to find out what you, the listeners, think is the greatest invention of the last 200 years. The response has been amazing, double the amount we had last year, so thanks to all of you for taking part. We've had about 2,000 responses online and about the same on our phone lines. The lines are now closed and this morning I can announce what the results were. So, here it is. You, the listeners, have chosen as the greatest technological invention of the past 200 years, and let me not forget to mention that 65% of you voted for this, it's the bicycle. Yes, the bicycle, first invented in 1818, and, would you believe it, the first bicycle was made of wood. The second bicycle had iron wheels. I cannot imagine what that must have been like to ride. It would have kept you fit at any rate. But for me, the best thing about the bicycle was what it did for women's rights. Yes, in the 1890s, it was the bicycle that meant women could change their clothing, start wearing trousers or pantaloons, as they were known. Before then, women's clothes had been really uncomfortable and I'd imagine quite difficult to breathe in. So, thanks to the ordinary bicycle, it was not only the man who wore the trousers in a home. Instead, women could now feel far more equal to their male contemporaries. And, I'm sure you'll agree, the bicycle is a great way to get regular exercise, and, of course, it's much better for the environment. And today, over one billion people all over the world ride bicycles, and for some, it's their only means of getting around from A to B. So, to all you bicycle riders out there, keep up the good work. Coming in a close second with 42% is the computer. 
I found out something interesting about the computer, which is that really this word first meant someone who did mathematical calculations. Of course, today, with the development of the personal computer, computers are being used for everything from home use to business and even digital photography. I don't know about you, but I can't imagine life without a computer now. I guess closely related to the computer is the internet, and this got 12% of your votes. Maybe, like myself, many of you might think of the internet as being the World Wide Web. But actually, the web is only one part of the internet. The internet began as part of the United States military network, but it later began to be used by businesses and academic institutions. Of course, today the internet has so many uses. We use it for shopping online and entertainment, as well as to find information and send emails. But sadly, there is a darker side to the internet, and some of you have sent me emails about this. Finally, with five percent of your votes, is the radio. We think the radio was invented by Marconi in 1896, and he opened his first radio or wireless factory in the United Kingdom in 1898. In 1906, a man called Reginald Fessenden gave the first radio broadcast from Massachusetts. Ships could hear him at sea, and apparently he played the violin. As yet, listeners, I've spared you from having to listen to my guitar playing, but certainly radio is still important. Let's not forget that it was by radio that the Titanic sent signals to other ships. And with the popularity of TV today, I was secretly pleased so many of you had still placed importance on the radio. So there you have it, the results of our survey. I think there are still important inventions that were not chosen but deserve a mention: nuclear power, and of course, communications satellite. Something which I am certain will continue to change the face of how we communicate with each other over both long and short distances. In fact, for me, the mobile phone is one of the greatest inventions of the last two hundred years. If I think back to my first phone, and then I look at what is happening now, children born today will probably be more likely to have their first experience of the internet on a mobile phone screen rather than a computer monitor. Some of the new mobiles that are now being sold make it just as easy and as quick to find information on the web as on a computer. And let's not forget that mobiles now have digital cameras, word processing facilities, so you can type all your documents, and even personal organizers. I think it's quite possible that the mobile may even replace computers one day. Part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.